Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overhaul with RP1 series in Kerbal Space Program 1.3.1 and in this episode we begin directly with a lunar lander mission in order to fulfill uh, the duplicate contract for that so basically we're just launching another lunar lander A trying to kill time while making funds uh, before we unlock the technology to send a Kerbal up uh, that'll take about 60 days I think uh, so we need crew survivability 8 days and basic capsules 51 days. I could toss on a few more upgrade points for that and uh, speed that up a little bit if this works. So if this works, uh, currently we have 1.165 million funds and uh, if this works I'll add upgrade points. If it doesn't work then there's no reason to rush because we're going to have to build another one of these in order to fulfill the mission. So we'll still have something to do. So, uh, with that uh, throttle up, SAS is on, and ignition. And launch. So it seems like given that we already have a lead as far as landing on the moon is concerned, maybe we should just focus on that. I mean, of course we'll have to take care of other contracts along the way, but it seems like our space agency uh, has it in as far as the moon is concerned. So, probably ought to just run with it. I'm not turning fast enough here. We will dominate the moon. It will be a blue moon, or what color? A green moon, obviously. It's a green moon. Right? Red moon if it's uh, Soviet Union. I have no idea what color it would be if it was uh, America. Uh, I guess that's just default. Uh, a green moon. Uh, but, uh, a green moon, yeah. Kerbal's land on it first. Now, we might have to upgrade the launch pad before doing that. I say might. <laughs> uh, we could launch quite a large series of Atlas rockets in order to do it. It's not impossible. But that requires a whole lot of docking. And a whole lot of fuel wasted docking, too. Okay, booster set. Booster engines are clear, they did their job, without any problems, and our Delta V looks good. I mean, uh, when we operate the engines, it's possible that we could get 5 tons off of this rocket. The only problem is the upper diameter here. Uh, we need to find where we get the, the tanks that are meant for a uh, Centaur, right? This was not meant for a Centaur. But uh, once we uh, get the tanks meant for a Centaur, and if we could unlock an RL-10, I mean, there's no telling what we could do with that. We're already landing on the moon without it. Okay, getting ready to shut down. And shut down. 193 by 152. Uh, a little bit more inclination than I wanted, but it shouldn't be a problem. And... Yep, good to separate. Separation. All the things separating at once. Uh, I said five tons. Maybe maybe four tons is a more modest goal. We, we're only carrying three tons. I thought we were carrying four tons for some reason. Um, a more modest goal when we uh, operate the engines might be, might be four tons. Which means that uh, Atlas could carry a Gemini spacecraft, I believe, if we had the right diameter on top. And that brings up a interesting, well, a whole series of interesting thoughts I had, uh, where you know I've been playing around with methane and oxygen engines off to the side, and I was thinking how much uh, lifting power we would get if uh, the engines in Atlas were methane oxygen engines, you know, and got 360 seconds ISP in vacuum, uh, not not even pushing the limits of methane and oxygen, mind you, um, and. Consider that we're bringing the entire fuel tank up to orbit every single time. And let's say uh, where they usually have the fuel umbilicals, uh, we actually had a docking port. And actually the umbilical itself was a docking port. Of course, it could have an explosive release for launch. But um, it, it would be a docking port that would allow refueling in orbit. Because, well, this whole thing is in orbit, right? It's a big... Oh, we, we're switching to everything else. It's a big empty tank right now, and it's a lightweight big empty tank. And if you had a reignitable engine at the bottom and RCS thrusters on it, it could be pretty useful, right? I mean, it would take quite a launch to fill it up, mind you, 
that you don't, wouldn't really need to fill it up to the top to get decent delta V on it. Uh, yeah, depending on the payload, of course. You could probably, I mean, even if you fill it up halfway and you had a Gemini capsule on top, you could probably make a lunar mission out of it. Just a thought. But that's, in that case, you would probably want the methane oxygen, oxygen mix, not the kerosene oxygen. But there's a problem with the whole balloon tank business, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know how long the balloon tanks have got to be happy. I mean, of course, it's in zero pressure, basically, in orbit. So maybe you know, they'll be happy enough. Uh, Raider Nick assures me that the Pioneer 5 will be nerfed <laughs> or somehow. I suggested that they just make it more expensive because right now the pricing of it is um, is less than that would be for the solar panels plus the comms plus the probe core uh, and, and plus the scientific instruments. If you just priced it right and made it more expensive, it might be a little bit more balanced. I mean, there's no arguing that it was a probe in 1960 and it did go into interplanetary space and communicate from there and had its own independent control. Um, I don't know if it, I mean, the probe core 0.1 ton, uh, I, I suppose it must have, but not totally sure. I think it didn't really have thrusters, did it? Still seems pretty far south, but it's certainly not where we landed before. That's our previous landing location. And there's a chance that we would still have communication there. Oh. Why why do we have a one second delay here? What the heck? Well, anyway. Um, ignition. Guys, something is horribly wrong. Uh, are we communicating? We're communicating through the moon right now? Or what? Where, where is our communication line going? That we've got one second delay. Mm, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, half of the time, it, it, see, it, it shows the line going this way. It seems like we're communicating through the moon, but then it could be communicating through that one too. I deleted a whole bunch of our lingering missions and that might be why we have a little bit less communications apparatus in orbit to support us. Um, 40 pieces of debris and 20 sort of things hang out in lower orbit that probably would have deorbited by now. The stuff that was higher up I left. We've got about 20 of those. Okay guys, I just realized I was muted through a bunch of stuff. Um, basically because I was coughing. Uh, so, um, we are doing a correction burn. Uh, our initial approach ended up here, which, apart from everything else, seemed a little bit close to where the lander is. By the time we actually got to, um, got to our periapsis, you know, made this journey, it might rotate to the point where we were landing at the same location. So I'm extending out. Actually, uh, it, the initial landing location was close. Anyway. Um, we're extending out to here with the RCS and that's good enough I think hopefully it won't rotate so much that we miss that target and I believe let me have MacJeb no landing guidance I should use that flight recorder sometime it might be helpful I mean, at least if it can... Yeah, there's a CSV option there. Someday. There might be some application that I might want it for. Okay, it's saying that we got to land there, but it still says the Sea of Tranquility, which is what I was expecting. Um, let's try and make it more definitive. Okay, but... Uh, it's a shallower sort of situation. It's sort, still sort of straight down, but not quite as straight down as last time. So I'm not sure about the timing, whether I can duplicate what I did last time. And then, you know, we have to trust the air beat, well, XASR, and we'll see whether that's going to work again. It's been very reliable recently. Of course, we have all the data points for it, 
But at some point, that 24 minutes meantime before failure is going to catch up to us. I still need to work on the landing script for KOS. The way we're doing it right now is somewhat iffy because uh, the throttle doesn't obey the signal delay, nor does MacJeb. And we're s I'm trying to make it programmatic the way I'm throttling it, but it's still not exactly right. Okay, well, we should at least orient. There's a sea of tranquility in front of us. Where exactly are we looking at landing? There? We probably got pulled it in by our retroburn, though. And let's remind ourselves one minute and five seconds to dump 1,841 meters per second, and then 1,500 meters per second after that. So this time, it seemed like we had way too much time on the previous attempt. I'm gonna try and wait till two minutes time to land that number. Okay, throttling up. Making sure this is settled. Oh, not that. Uh, where's the engine? Ah, shoot. Okay, good. A little bit longer than I wanted to wait. Okay, XS XASR is lit. Ended up being like 1 minute 50 seconds. Or 55 maybe. But what we see here is the time to land is actually still uh, is actually going up. So we could probably have waited a little bit longer. But it's still closer than the last time. And there's, you know, an option for if it falls short, if the XASR fails before the end of its burn, we could still use the one kill newton thruster to finish. But it seems to be a stalwart. We needn't have worried. Okay, well we're gonna separate it off now. Because the RCS is all on this anyway. Now you might go, well, a straight up suicide burn would be more efficient with like KOS or something, but you have to take into consideration that this is a program operating at a certain physics rate. It is not real life. And so it does calculations in a discrete manner and you have to leave a little bit of room for it to make those calculations really. There's a potential for delay. Well, now we're in sort of dubious signal delay territory. Uh, sorry about this. This is very wobbly. Probably more sideways than I'd like to. Ah, but we managed it. Jeez, that was rough. Okay, RCS off. Fortunately, we've got this sort of uh, balloon sort of situation, I guess. I mean, not balloon tanks, but I mean, it's like we've got little inflatables on the side or something. Okay, well, uh, transmit science. So it's got everything else is fine. And let's see if we've got some new signs to send. We do. Log radiation, that's always the big one. 36 science. Okay, we've gotten all the science. And our contract is fulfilled. All right. Well, now I have to figure out something else to do in the meantime because we're still waiting on the technology to send a crew up. Okay, well, they did give us another lunar landing contract. There is also lunar landing in sample return, but that really is a little bit ambitious at this point. I mean... Yes, we have that 600 meters per second, but uh, that's just 600 meters per second. So, Lunar Rover, I, I'd rather not, because it has to travel to different sites. Lots of science, though. Um, second generation navigation satellite. It's not the best paying thing ever, but it, uh, it should be quick. And, yeah, I mean, uh, we might as well proceed. I feel like if we did more of these other ones, like early na uh, early weather satellite, though I swear we did an early weather satellite before, 
that we would get a second generation one and pay a little bit better, but not a whole lot better. You see, this is 72,000. This is basically 100,000. So it's not like it's a tremendous improvement. And we've done communication and test satellite before. They just want another one. I don't know whether I want to do that or not. We'll see. Um, can we do multiple of these at the same time? Well, uh, periaps above 9,000. Well, this is a very specific apoapsis. But here, this just says above that. And no, this says uh, this wants it circular. But uh, let's say we put it at 900 kilometers. And we've got this one. That's a navsat. We'll have to. Well, th this says second generation navigation satellite, but it wants a comsat payload. Something's confused. But so uh, this payload would satisfy this payload as well. So that's important. And let's say we got 900 kilometers. Well, this periapsis wants to be above 921337. 921337 happens to, well, happens to be within that so it's pretty close but this wants an inclination between 9, uh, 68 and 72 this just says above 30 hmm so my, my question is could we get into this orbit and then boost up to that orbit with like the one kilonewton thruster or something well uh we've uh we, we can try it we can try it you know the thing about solar panel pricing is that I've seen old satellites. They used to cover the bloody things in solar panels. If they were costing this much, they probably wouldn't have. And uh, when you consider the Pioneer 5 here costing 360, generating uh, how many watts of power? It says 800, but let's say 200, uh, because we really, just let's just use one panel. Um, uh, let me pick out, uh, this is our largest panel right now, 15 watts. Eight of these uh, is 1,200, and eight of these would generate 120 watts. So, yeah, that, that's what I mean by this is severely underpriced for the power it generates. I mean, obviously, what I ought to do right now, just for the solar panels, is put this on top. But, yeah, solar panels, really expensive, quite distressing, leads us to use like two of them. In other news, I still understand how these are the only antennae that we actually managed to have here. I feel like there's something horribly wrong <laughs> that, that these are my only options. Okay, I think I've got candidate next-gen ComSat configured here and we'll be putting on Atlas probably because we have to go to the high inclination with it and it's 1.77 tons. Now I'm using Hydrazine here and I'm very tempted to unlock that Kavia B thing, but I'm rather suspicious of it. I'm suspicious of it because, first of all, there's scant sources on it, and there really isn't very much. And if it was this good at this period in time, I mean, take a look, the Hydrazine's 198, the Kavia B is just another uh, mod propellant, and it's 258 uh, for six extra cost. I mean, it seems like they would have used it a lot, right? So why didn't they? Why isn't it like all over the place? What's up with it? I mean, 75000 is a hefty unlock cost, but considering the benefit, I mean, I guess because they got MMH and NTO, uh, NTO but they're still using hydrazine on, hydrazine on stuff because it's a mop propellant and it's simpler. But uh, yeah, if we can do it with this mission with just the hydrazine, that's fine. And right now, this says 19 watts during time warp, during low power mode. It's 190 watts otherwise. And we've got two of these solar panels on each side, and each of those uh, provides uh, 15 watts, we'll say. So that's 30 watts. That's the main expense of this right now, is just those. I don't suppose those need, like, tooling or something, do they? No, it doesn't say that. I mean, I was hoping that we could just tool the solar panels or something, because that would make it cheaper. But apparently not. Apparently we can't just cover the whole thing with solar panels like they did. All right, let me uh, pair it up with an atlas and see if we've got what we need. Well, I've gone with two front-mounted solar panels like this instead to fit them in. And the antennae are sort of jutting out a little bit, but I can't do anything about that. Um, if I put them on the side, they're going to be poking out anyway. So hopefully it'll work out. But uh, yeah, I've never seen a satellite like this before, but 
satellite like this before, but that seems like the best arrangement at this point. And it'll give us the power we need. It's 30 watts up there. Maybe a little bit less than that because they're angled, but uh, we just need 19. All right. I'm thinking about whether I need, I could just dump the RD0109 stage. It's probably not necessary. So we could just do this. Oh, but we do need something to transition between stuff. We probably need just the fairing. It'll be quite a exciting ride. Now is leaving off the RD-0109 stage a good idea? Not sure. Yeah, it'll be uh, 13,313. So about 10% cost reduction on the version that doesn't have this stage in. I guess we'll, we'll go with that and try it out first. Okay, here we are with the ComSat launch and checking out the contracts. It is satisfied that we have enough ComSat payload there. And yes, on this one as well. And we do have power. Um, throttle is up, SAS on, and ignition. And launch. So surface, we want a heading basically of 15. It'll look like we're sort of going sideways compared to what we normally do with the Atlas. But I'm not going to have it roll. We're going to try and directly go to a high or well, at least the 900 kilometer orbit that we require. So we'll have an initial orbit of 900 by 140, basically. Okay, booster set. A little bit late on that. But we're looking good. We need to actually moderate our heading because we risk going above the required inclination. Right around there seems good for the time being. And yeah, it satisfies the above 30 degrees, so that's good too. We're gonna burn through this entire stage, I'm sure. We can separate the fairing now. Or not. <laughs> we went a little bit too far. 24 meters per second left in this. Uh, I was aiming for 900 kilometers, but we went past that. Okay, well, we don't need to decouple this, really. We just need to decouple this. Okay, and RCS. Well, let's activate all these things. And, of course, we don't have forward thrusters with the RCS. Rotation. Rotation is fine. Okay. So, power-wise, we should verify that, but let's... Um, turn retrograde a bit. I, I want to sidestep the stage. Let's wait for it to pass by. <laughs> Good Atlas stage. All right. Okay, so that's 924 point. Okay, so that satisfies that. And it would satisfy that, but it's a pretty close margin. I think I should... Give it a few more, things, just in case we accidentally increase that apoapsis while we're doing the burn to circularize. Okay, so that's pretty good. And then we just do two burns at that apoapsis. The first to circularize for this contract. And then the second burn immediately after once that's, the contract is fulfilled to satisfy this contract seems simple but let's make sure we're getting power now um, even this close to the Sun it's not charging okay well when we're time warping it should be fine let's see relative rotation Sun okay stop 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 stop, stop. uh we're accidentally spin stabilized no nope okay there we go 
And yes, we're recharging now, now that we're in time warp, good. And there is a spin. And ignition. Okay, that should be fine. Mm, that's down here. Yep, it's checking the orbit. Let's wait. Okay, that's confirmed. Awesome. We got paid. I spent a lot on um, upgrade points for the science. So right now it's still got to take a little bit of time. Still 34 more days for basic capsules, but I sped it up a bit. I think it's 0.7 science per day now. Okay, well, now that that's done, we can focus on this one, and all we have to do is get to that apoapsis, so continue burning, please. Um, the periapsis is above 921. No matter what, it's going to be above 921, so it'll be fine. Well, that should be good enough. Alright, we're waiting the two minutes. And that is confirmed as well. Yep. First communication satellite. What nonsense. What nonsense. Anyway. Uh, we got the money. Good. And this is doing its comsat thing, I suppose. Maybe it'll help out at some point. While we time warp it, it's still recharging. So it's good. All right. Back to Space Center. Okay. Well, I don't really want to do anything except for prepare for our capsules and aim for crude flight finally. And so I've decided to create a sort of mass simulator and we'll just build the rest of the rocket ahead of time so that we are ready to go once we unlock the capsules. And we'll build two of these, one to be uncrewed and another crewed, but we've got a mass simulator here in the form of an avionics unit that's uh, 0.76 tons and then also if you throw in the heat shield you'll get about the same mass as the capsule we're going to unlock. Um, we have a secondary avionics unit here because we're going to be replacing this part and that part with the capsule, but we want to be able to test it uncrewed, so we need another avionics unit here, so that's why that's there. And then we have the RCS unit, this is the hydrazine. This is actually uh, the retropropellant unit, and so we've got the one kilonewton thruster there with hydrazine, and then the parachute. So, What's going to happen is, we don't actually have a service module. Um, that's not what this is. Uh, so this is actually the service module. We're just carrying it right back down with us. We're going to release this nose cone, and then it'll be free to do the retro. Now, that means our heat shield is not technically protected, but then again, for the Mercury flights, they weren't really protected very well either. The retro uh, package was really small compared to the heat shield, so it was rather vulnerable. Uh, I had a bit of trouble trying to figure out exactly how to mate the the capsule, which is two meters in diameter at the top, with this stage, which is not, and uh, without you know creating new fairings to be tooled. So this is the situation. Uh, this is our launch escape system, uh, as you can see. Uh, it provides more than 10 Gs uh, to lift all of this up, and yeah, I I didn't want to make a tower. Uh, partly because of this setup here and uh, so we're switching basically the location of the tower with the location of the service module. The service module is on top now, this is on the bottom. And yeah, I, I'm fine with this. <laughs> uh, this will be an ob it's something different, let's face it. Uh, this is not going to be the setup for like the Gemini capsule or anything, but then again, they used ejection seats for that, and I'm, I'm partial to that uh, myself. But we do have the abort um, system all set up. It's not very complicated. This decouples, and then we activate all those engines. And once we replace this with the capsule, that'll be the same. So, yep, I think that's, that's about it. I'm not entirely sure I need to do anything else. Uh, later on, right now we don't have any way to generate power. And that's because this is only to complete the orbital flight. But uh, if we want to add power, we can add some more uh, batteries in here. We can add solar panels if we... I mean, we're never going to have enough solar panels to actually provide enough power for the pod. Because that would need extendable solar panels. So we'll need fuel cells for that initially. 
and I don't think we have those yet. So we'll have to wait to unlock those for extended missions. But anyway, so I'm going to build two of these. And let me just make sure that makes that all makes sense. All right. And thruster configuration is hydrazine. We haven't got the Kavia B. I'll wait until you guys explain. I know, I know about ignition. Okay, so don't don't tell me. Oh, it, it appeared in the book ignition. Yes, yes, I've read that. Uh, I mean, what? Why? Why? Why didn't we use it? Um, that that's really what I want to know. Where where's where's all the information about it? I just want more sources of information than that one book. And yeah. Anyway, so this is going to be what we build. We'll build two of them and then we'll edit it and replace the capsule. Okay, we're in the replacement phase. I brought this in for editing and you might wonder why I don't use the mercury capsule and that's because it's already got the thing on top and I wanted to put my own thing on top. So that's basically why this is cheaper. So yeah, I'm not entirely sure why mercury has to be more expensive, but I go for the cheaper option. And we still uh, we do have to unlock it separately, alas. Also, uh, the Mercury reentry module shouldn't have the um, COM offset for uh, descent mode. This says it does. This says that uh, the center mass can be offset slightly, so it even has descent mode. Well, that's good enough for me. Um, HTP, I really don't want it to be HTP, but if it's going to be HTP, I guess that's how it's going to be. So it's got that RCS in it, but we've got the other RCS. We've got like 500 meters per second up here. Okay, fine, maybe more like 400, but I don't know what it's counting there. So yeah, the one thing that I might want to consider is flipping the avionics here around so that it's oriented properly, but you know, it's a minor thing. It's going to be a quick mission. I'm not trying to dock with anything. Not that I would be able to. So yeah, it's not a big deal. So now I want to, I hope we can, oh wow, it's going to take 41 days? We This was completely constructed except for the capsule. It's going to take 41 days now? I don't even want to know about the rollout costs, do I? Where are the rollout costs hiding that from me? It at this point occurs to me that we don't have any actual Kerbals. Inuki. Hmm. Inuki is a good name. Sid Doc, Sig Doc is, okay, that's actually hard for me to say. Phil, Philvy. Hmm. Lots of courage on Philvy. Burlock, Chadbart. Agagas. Trihat. Hmm. I feel like Anuki should be a girl, but anyway, um, <laughs> uh, Philvy. We'll go with Philvy. No earlier than 1972. That gives us enough time, I think. Now, I, I remember there's a training thing. Well, what's the point of training Kerbals we don't even have? Um, but how do I train them? Courses. Mercury, no. Well, but, but what about the capsule that we've actually got? We'll take 260 days. I mean, this isn't a Mercury capsule, it's a Mark 1. I. I don't know. Will we be able to put Philby in? Hmm. Well, let's let's just find out the practical way. I might turn off the training thing altogether. It's a little bit more of a hassle than I need, especially with them retiring and everything. I know it's realisms, but... Okay, launch. Uh, no, it doesn't look like we can put Philby in. Now, that's a Mark I pod. So, but that's not a course that we can pick. Mercury is a course we can pick. But this isn't a Mercury. I don't want to delay my space program by 260 days. 
And we're going to be going on to other pod. What the heck just happened? It got bugged. It heard me complaining, I think. Um, probably if we go out and in, it'll be fixed. But how about just to the R&D building? No. Okay. You know what? <laughs> uh, I, I don't want the training thing. <laughs> this is a step too far. Maybe some other time. Crew requires training. Then forget retirement. That irritated me all, all the way. I lost all the regulars. So now, if we wanted to, Phil V can be in there. They cost too much. They're like 50,000. We'll just say that they come ready trained, darn it. And our capsules are like Airbuses. They all work about the same. <laughs> you know? Okay, so let's launch without a Kerbal in, but we can do so in more at the morning. We don't have any particular window. It looks a little bit silly here. That's a big nose on it, I am aware. But all right. Yep, ignition. And launch. There's got to be some pretty high G-forces right at the end. There's no avoiding that. I mean, the big nose is because of our tooling, and that's the 1.2 meter tooling. Well, shading down by as many percent as they give me leeway. How's the drag up here? Uh, pretty substantial. Okay, booster set. That was at 6.5 G's. Well, it looks like we have enough when we sh we ought to. We're going to uh, regular inclination and we're carrying less of a load than uh, than we did on the previous launch. And that was to a substantial inclination. We've got a roll. Uh, this is the first time I've actually... I think it's the first time we've seen Atlas have a residual roll. Interesting. Do we need to unlock the LR-101s, the little vernier thrusters? Hmm. I really do need to see how much time we've got. Alright, that looks good. Atlas tends to go into these tight orbits, which is good, but we do actually have to get above that 140 kilometer mark. Six, seven Gs. Basically seven Gs. And we're a little bit low on the periapsis. Okay. Well, anyway, we can finish with the pod's own little OMS engine, if you will. Uh, separation. All right. The pod is free. And it needs to free up its thruster... So, uh, did that actually let go of this? Yes, it did. Okay, I thought it would release it with a little bit more vigor, but all right. I'm seeing a bit of a flaw in the system. All right, knock it, knock it. Yep, good job. All right, technically we need to go retrograde. I guess we can release these fairings at the same time we pop that parachute. Seems fair. And we can use these thrusters first. Alright, well, let's go over Australia and then we'll retro burn. Plenty of power. At this point, I'll arm the parachutes. Make sure both of them are armed. Okay, 70 kilometers or so should be fine. Um, back retrograde. Well, this arrangement was somewhat inspired by the fact that they seem to have a lot of trouble getting their retro packages off. Uh, whether it was Mercury or, um, or, or uh, Vostok, 
The retro packages seem to like to stick on. In this case, that's not a big problem. Um, yeah, but, but we do have to make sure that the nose comb actually gets off. That's an additional issue. But then again, that was true of Mercury, Gemini as well. Because they had uh, shrouded heat shield, uh, shrouded parachutes as well. So that's not unusual. I'm not going to have descent mode on. We'll see how it goes. We'll do it Mercury style. And we should go negative surface velocity now. I think for the real crude mission, I'll underfuel the top of it just so it doesn't wiggle around too much. After all, it's pretty heavy at the top right now. And I wonder if that's going to cause any problems. It's using pitch authority. Well, let, this is the time to check it out. Let's say I don't use pitch authority. Is it going to flip over in this situation? Even if we did keep all the fuel, we could just actually use it and go to a higher orbit and come back down. We may be facing a lot of G's coming down because we're not using descent mode, but it's probably not as much as we were facing going up. This scale is always a little bit off. I mean, going up, we max out at 7 G's. Alright, it's coming back down, right? Did we pass 7 G's? We, we got to 7.1. Well, it could be worse. They could be in a Vostok. So, where are we? Uh, close to the Pacific? I mean, close to the West Coast? Looks like it. Okay, we have full parachute deployment bringing us to 4.4 meters per second. A luxuriously slow speed to impact the ground at. Not much of leader loss, I mean, one-fifth. And splash down, and recover. Come on, recover. Recover. Okay, well I think that was quite satisfactory. We even got some science out of it. Nine science. Recovery of vessel returned from Earth orbit, really? We've done that before. Anyway, and we got some funds back. No crew back, of course. But next time, next time I think we're cleared to attempt the crewed atlas with Phil... Philby? Was it? Philby. Um, boy, they, they were expensive to hire. You'd think the training costs would be bundled into that. I mean, just just for a reference, um, that would be four hundred million dollars in current dollars because fifty thousand funds is fifty million dollars in nineteen sixty dollars. Should it really cost fifty million dollars to hire an astronaut? Usually, they were just people from the Air Force, and you know, I know you could add all the medical staff in that was supposed to check them out and all the trainers and everything and it still probably wouldn't be 50 million 60 1960 dollars so yeah that's pretty expensive and i'm i'm gonna cheat on the training you guys can tell me what you think about that i don't know i just want to get it on with it uh we can turn it on later if necessary but boy uh well 500 only i wonder why it costs fifty thousand to hire them in and only 500 in salary per year. Hmm. There was research teams though. They're charging me for integration here too, so I don't know. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I've got so many gripes. But yeah, next time uh, we are going to attempt a crewed mission to orbit. We'll pick up that contract once the rocket is built. And I want to look into sending something to Mars once we've got Oh, we've already got actually the antennae for interplanetary communications. Please tell me it's act they're actually there now. That we actually have some more antennae except for the first three. Okay, yeah, so that's the plan. Um, this one says maximum effective range approximately 580 gigameters. This one, with some care, Mars, we might put two on for that. It depends on our tracking station, too. One gigameter. It is three gigameters dish power. We might as well just use this one. Uh, two of those would be more massive than just one of these. We'll see. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.